Today's session is going to be on hemostasis and really the introduction to hemostasis and thrombosis by association. When I think about hemostasis, the way that I describe it is it's the way that the body maintains appropriate blood flow with a balance of clotting and bleeding as appropriate. If there's too much clotting, spontaneous thrombus occurs and if there's too much bleeding, there can be anemia that can be life-threatening and obviously anemia will affect many organ systems uh, of its own accord and hypovolemia uh, and dehydration will also uh, occur. So the learning objectives here will be understanding the, the function of hemostasis um, and how the body maintains uh, the balance that I spoke of, uh, including the contributions of the vascular endothelium, the platelets and the coagulation factors. And those three together are the really important players and the way that they interact determines whether we have you know, healthy and physiological uh, clot formation when there's injury, um, or if there's either inappropriately low coagulation or thrombus formation or inappropriately high um, thrombotic effect. And we want to understand where platelets and coagulation factors come from because understanding their origin and what stimulates their production or interferes with them can help us understand how many therapeutics and diseases um, affect hemostasis. And finally, we want to understand the disruption of primary versus secondary hemostasis and how it manifests. I've divided this talk into five different levels and the idea is that each of the levels will build upon the knowledge of the previous one. Let's start with level one. What is hemostasis and why and how do we clot? So to think about hemostasis generally, like I said, it's about how the body maintains appropriate balance of clotting and bleeding to ensure good flow of blood. And the whole point of good flow of blood is about organ perfusion to keep the whole body running. So primary hemostasis you can think about is the initial clot formation and the clot which is a platelet plug. The secondary hemostasis is something that doesn't occur after primary hemostasis has occurred. It's actually something that occurs in parallel with primary hemostasis. So the trigger for hemostasis will start usually both the primary focus as well as the secondary. And in fact, within primary hemostasis, there's a number of processes that will be triggers for secondary hemostasis to occur. So the secondary hemostasis is about providing cross-linking uh, of fibrin that will kind of cement the clot. So I think of it like the, the initial, the primary hemostasis with the platelet plug is almost like a scaffolding. And without then putting the cement in to hold everything together, the scaffolding with enough stress will eventually fall apart. It's not there for long term. You need something stronger to then hold things together. And then finally, thrombus is usually more than is required uh, to stem the throat of bleeding, but it's an emergency measure to, to prevent um, life-threatening hemorrhage. And so we need to have a process that helps clean up and dissolve clots when their function has, has ceased. And so that's called fibrinolysis. It's where we break down the fibrin uh, cross-linking that occurs in secondary hemostasis and then platelets and the rest of the uh, elements of the platelet plug will then uh, dissolve and be recycled. Let's just summarize that simply. Primary hemostasis is the formation of the platelet plug. Secondary hemostasis is the fibrin mesh that holds that plug together for more than a matter of minutes or hours. Without it, it will actually dissolve very quickly under stress. And fibrinolysis is the dis dissolution of that clot when it has served its purpose. And that may be some days or weeks later. Here's a pictorial representation. You can see here, like the damage to a blood vessel, maybe it's um, through, you know, maybe you scratch yourself or cut yourself with something sharp on the skin. Um, that cut will pierce some blood vessels, whether it be capillaries, arterioles, or venules. The process is similar, even though the anatomy is slightly different that triggers some release of clotting factors, and it will then trigger a, a um, platelet plug, to, uh, which is accompanied with vasoconstriction uh, of the vessel to minimize hemorrhage. The platelet plug is then um, cemented and, and cross-linked in terms of the platelets with fibrin, which forms this fibrin mesh, and then later you can have dissolution through fibrinolysis. There's some really great visuals that you can see, and I'd really recommend the site uh, Thrombosis Advisor on YouTube. The channel has a lot of really great visual representations of that. If you're a really visual learner, I'd strongly recommend that you follow this link and just have a look at that uh, two minute video that summarizes the primary and secondary hemostatic processes there. So now that we understand the basics of hemostasis, let's look at level two, which is what is the trigger for clot formation and how do platelets activate? Because the activation of that platelet is such an essential part of the hemostatic process. When we think about triggers of clot formation, there are a number of key players. And most of the key players I'm gonna highlight here have a role in terms of diseases that affect them or medications that can inhibit them, uh, which are all parts of how we then treat either through antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy, which we'll talk about more in a second talk uh, on introduction to uh, thrombosis treatment.
So the key players here that can trigger clots are collagen and tissue factor. They're the number one causes of, of clot formation and the triggering of platelets. So when there is damage to a vessel, collagen is exposed and collagen is not usually exposed to blood and collagen when exposed to blood and particularly platelets will actually trigger them to activate. The platelets themselves when they activate change shape so they actually become more sticky and there is a process of adhesion and the adhesion happens both to the endothelial or damaged endothelial surface and to each other along with a number of red blood cells. The red blood cells themselves are not particularly adhesive, they're mainly used as large kind of um, entities to plug a gap uh, and the platelets are the ones holding them together. So that activation through collagen and also secondarily through tissue factor. So tissue factor is also uh, a factor that's usually exposed, not really in the blood very much, there's small circulating levels of, of um, tissue factor uh, physiologically and in some disease states there are higher circulating amounts of tissue factor which is why some people have a hypercoagulable state. We'll talk more about that later, especially in the role of atherosclerosis. But tissue factor can also be exposed when there's damage to the endothelial lining and the vessel itself. And so both of those are really key players in starting that clot formation and often are the number one trigger for um, thrombosis to occur. There are a number of factors then that play uh, in terms of adhering the platelets either to the surface of the endothelium or to each other. And major ones there would be von Willebrand factor. Von Willebrand factor helps bind collagen to platelets uh, and so that's a really major player. And so those with von Willebrand's disease where they're um, either lacking von Willebrand factor or they're producing less um, effective von Willebrand factor have a problem with pla pla platelet adhesion. There's also ADP. Um, which is released by platelets to trigger other platelets to activate. And you'll see that there are primary triggers, but once a platelet is activated, it releases these alpha and dense granules that are full of pro-coagulant substances like ADP and other uh, proteins and cytokines that then are picked up by platelets that are floating nearby and the vascular endothelial wall itself to cause a vasoconstriction and further activation of, of platelets along with thrombin. Then there's other um, elements, so fibronectin, probably um, an important player in terms of by adhering to the endothelial wall, but not one that we particularly target with any kind of drugs or disease. But glycoprotein 2B3A is a really important binder, and that's what binds to, uh, on the surface of platelets, um, it helps uh, bind to other platelets, and the binding element is the fibrin itself. So the fibrin activates and then binds those uh, receptors together between platelets, and that's what the cross-linking occurs. So that's a really important role in terms of how platelets activate and how then the, the fibrin um, cross-linking happens to cement the plug-in. Really important one, and one that we have a number of therapeutics that target. And finally, fibrinogen itself, which I've just spoken about, we have medications that will target fibrinogen um, in terms of plasmin activators. And we also, the states that reduce fibrinogen will obviously have an effect in terms of platelet uh, cross-linking. So here's this very fancy picture of a platelet. And if this is your first time seeing this, it's gonna look very complicated. So what I've done here is uh, highlight a number of the elements that uh, are active in terms of um, the processes I just discussed. You can see at the top, we're seeing endothelium, endothelial cells that are there, and between them it's like a break, and the collagen and tissue factor and von Willebrand factor are active in that kind of space there. They are often the, the initial signals that the early platelets that are in that area will receive, and they bind to certain receptors, and then that activates the platelet itself to release granules. And then you can see, like on the uh, left-hand side of the picture, ADP is released by a platelet, and then that can go to other platelets and bind to uh, P2Y12 um, receptors, leading to further platelet activation. You can also see um, through arachidonic acid, or AA, you can get cyclooxygenase 1 activation, which then um, causes thromboxane A2 to be produced and released. It's aspirin that targets that cyclooxygenase 1 to prevent thromboxane A2 being released and activating other platelets. And you can also see that this main platelet in the middle is binding to a platelet nearby through the 2B3A receptor on both sides. So one, one receptor on one platelet binds to the other receptor and the mediator is fibrinogen converting into fibrin. And we have some drugs that can affect that. We'll talk about that in another talk. Also, you can see thrombin has a role in terms of activating platelets through the PAR1 uh, and PAR4 receptors. Although that's not the main role of thrombin, you can see how the processes of primary hemostasis and platelet activation and secondary hemostasis with fibrin activation actually have a lot of cross-activating processes at play. So now that we understand a little bit 
about how platelets are activated, the triggers and the processes of that occurring, let's talk a bit more about thrombin and fibrinogen and why do we have this coagulation cascade at all. When I was a medical student, I found hemostasis a bit dry and boring. And I remember having over several years having to relearn the coagulation cascade because I'd forget it and I still forget which one's the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway at times. And I think it's really important in the bigger picture to understand why do we have this coagulation cascade? If thrombin is the main one that then activates fibrin, why do we need all these other factors that seem to activate each other? And the reason is hemostasis. It's a balance of clotting and bleeding at the right time. And having all of these checks and balances and regulating proteins ensures there is not excess activation of thrombin and therefore excess cleavage of fibrinogen to fibrin and then you'll have these spontaneous thrombi that does occur in some disease states. It's really important that thrombus occurs at the right time in the right place and does not occur in the wrong time or in the wrong place. And having a coagulation cascade with a number of kind of checks by all of these factors being activated and then cleared away at the right time helps keep our body in balance in terms of the right balance of clotting and bleeding, i.e. hemostasis. So that's why we have a coagulation cascade. I don't think it's super important as a student to understand or memorize exactly all of these elements, but I think the common pathway is the really important one, understanding that there is a tissue factor pathway and there's a contact activation pathway, and both of them eventually lead to 10A being activated and prothrombin being converted to thrombin. So the common pathway occurs at the level of factor 10, uh, because both of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways end at that point. The common pathway has 10 going to 10A, and A just means activated, and then that produces Factor two, also known as prothrombin, going to 2A, which is thrombin. And then thrombin causes fibrinogen, the genesis of fibrin, which is factor one, to convert into activated factor one, which is fibrin. And fibrin does the cross-linking. So they're the main kind of parts of the coagulation cascade. And it's really important if you factor what we're seeing in this picture with what we've talked about already, you can see that tissue factor has a strong role in the extrinsic pathway and damaged surfaces of endothelium also, and that's where collagen can activate as well. And that's often, both of those factors are through trauma, which can be external or also internal as well. And ultimately it's leading to thrombin activation. So you can see also that there are some checks and balances like in terms of anticoagulant factors. So you look at the coagulation cascade and you can see, okay, all of these factors that I'm seeing here that are named are generally pro-coagulant factors. The activation of those factors would ultimately contribute to more thrombotic activity and the activation of thrombin, which leads to the activation of fibrin. But there are other factors at play there as well that are actually anticoagulant factors. And one of the most important ones at play there is antithrombin. Unsurprisingly, antithrombin clears away activated factor two, thrombin, but it also has a really strong effect on, on factor 10A. And it's through heparin, which we'll talk about in another talk, it actually increases antithrombin's effect by a thousand fold to make it a clear away more and more active factor and therefore shift the balance of coagulation towards an anticoagulated state. So now we've done three levels. Level four is about where do platelets come from and where do clotting factors come from? Because their origin will understand some processes that can occur to reduce their efficacy. So if we're looking at a blood film, if this is your first time, let me orient you. This is a blood film that has a number of red cells. You can see that red cells are the most popular cells in our blood. And this is a blood smear if you're ever looking it up or a blood film. You can see that they're large and red and because of their biconcave or donut-like appearance, they've got this uh, kind of hypochromic state in the middle whilst a thickened red side on the outside showing that ring. There are some other cells here as well. The bigger cells that you're looking at are probably neutrophils, particularly the ones at the bottom. The one in the middle is probably a neutrophil but maybe an activated um, uh, lymphocyte. The white cells themselves are bigger than uh, red blood cells, but far less numerous. You can see there's only three white cells here for what may be 100 red cells. And then the very small uh, cells in between are the platelets. You can see them. They're not nucleated, uh, much like red cells. And actually the proper term for a platelet is a thrombocyte. They're very small cells. Uh, they're not as numerous as uh, red cells are, but they are more numerous than white cells. For most of us, we have, in terms of per litre, around about 150 to 400 billion platelets. And they're the numbers that we're usually dealing in per litre. But you can see that we actually have about 100 billion red cells at a usual state. So you can see there are more populous cells and white cells much less than that. 
So thrombocytes come from the bone marrow where they're produced from a cell that is nucleated called a megakaryocyte. You can get from the name mega that it is a very large cell. It's the largest cell that we usually have in our bone marrow. The megakaryocyte produces all of these thrombocytes that basically peel off. They're like factories for thrombocytes because you need so many of them. There's not actually many megakaryocytes. They're probably the least numerous, even though they're the largest cells in the bone marrow. And they just sit there and constantly peel off these little thrombocytes that don't have a nucleus and they only last for about seven to 10 days in circulation uh, before they're recycled, usually by the spleen. Within the thrombocytes themselves or the platelets, they have these little granules, alpha and dense granules that like I mentioned before, contain procoagulant and platelet activating um, proteins and, and messengers. And, and that's their activation releases those granules that then you know, it reinforces or accentuates uh, primary and secondary hemostasis. So what about clotting factors? Where do they come from? There's a whole range of them from one up to 13. And there's more that are not named and maybe even more that are not numbered. Where are they coming from? Almost all clotting factors are actually produced in the liver compared to platelets produced in the bone marrow. So understanding that means that when we know we have liver disease like um, cirrhosis, um, that can reduce the amount of clotting factors that are produced. There are a number of clotting factors that depend on particular micronutrients for production. And there's a group of them 2, 7, 9, and 10 that are classically produced by vitamin K. They require vitamin K for production. And so we've worked out ways to uh, reduce the recycling of vitamin K so that vitamin K becomes deplete in the body and those 2, 7, 9, and 10 procoagulant factors then become reduced and you can shift the state into one that is more of an anticoagulant rather than procoagulant state. That's using a drug called warfarin, a vitamin K antagonist. But they're produced in the liver. And so understanding that will help you understand that liver disease states will ultimately mean that clotting factors may be reduced and you may have a coagulopathy associated with chronic liver disease. So lastly, let's talk about ways that um, there, there can be disease processes or medications that interfere with hemostasis and how do these disorders of hemostasis classically present clinically. If we think about primary hemostasis deficiencies, it's really simple to kind of classify them as having not enough platelets or conditions or medications that reduce our platelets down to a very low number. That's called thrombocytopenia, literally a thrombocyte reduction in the blood, and so low number. We actually, even though we usually have 150 to 400 billion platelets in circulation, it's not until we get down to about 10 to 20 or less billion per litre that we can have spontaneous hemorrhage. The body is remarkably adept at compensating for low platelets until they get very low, unless you have an active hemorrhage or other um, forms of anticoagulant state um, like sepsis. And then the more common issue that we're dealing with is platelet dysfunction. So it could be that they have innately a problem within the cells that you may be born with or acquire at some point where the platelets are less effective at usually adhering or activating each other. And that could, the classic example of that is von Willebrand's disease. It's an inherited disorder that means you are lacking most of the normal amounts of von Willebrand factor, which means the platelets can no longer adhere to the endothelial wall, and that's a big problem. Or you can have medications or antiplatelet uh, agents, which we'll talk about in another talk, that reduce the effect of activation and adherence of uh, platelets, and that will reduce their effect. Even though the numbers of platelets are the same, they're not actually as active as they should be. The clinical features of primary hemostatic disorders are of excessive bleeding. Because you can't form an effective platelet plug, any bleeding that occurs, or this is classically occurs in dental or other surgery when someone is maybe in their teenage years, and they might have noticed previously, yeah, I seem to bruise a lot more than the average person, uh, but never had any problems with bleeding. Once they have a you know, traumatic event or surgery, they find that they just keep oozing. And even though the body is using compensatory mechanisms to reduce or prevent a major hemorrhage, they're still just not stopping bleeding because that platelet plug can never properly stick around to get cemented. And even though secondary hemostasis is preserved, there's no platelet plug to cement with the fibrin. That's a big problem. This classically presents with a group of manifestations called mucocutaneous bleeding. So muco is in mucosa, uh, particularly of the GI tract or sometimes the respiratory tract, their mucosal lining and that's where um, there's usually a high turner of cells and spontaneous hemorrhage can occur. And then cutaneous, as in the skin, where we see petechial hemorrhage as well as bruising that occurs within the skin. So we'll see this pattern of easy or spontaneous bruising, like very small bumps suddenly have very large bruises. A petechial rash, which is where capillaries within the, the cutaneous layer of the skin uh, that actually rupture and hemorrhage, and you have all these micro hemorrhages in the skin that usually happens globally over the body. 
You can have epistaxis, which is a fancy word for nose bleeding. So people with low platelet counts or who have von Willebrand disease often uh, present with epistaxis. You can also have gum bleeding because that's a prominent area where you can have food that scratches away at the gums and as a mucosal lining, the vascular endothelium is very close to the surface. And then you can have gastrointestinal bleeding and this presents with melina, which is digested blood from the upper GI that comes out in the stool, or hematemesis, which is the vomiting of blood that's usually from uh, a gastric source. This is what a petechial rash looks like at high magnification. You can see lots of very small bleeding spots that are kind of contained. So they won't continue to cause a major hemorrhage because they're contained by the connective tissue of the skin, but you can see how those capillaries have uh, hemorrhaged. We contrast that with secondary hemostasis disorders. This is a different pattern of bleeding and a different group of disorders. So like von Willebrand's disease is an inherited disorder, there are some really well-known disorders of inherited bleeding in secondary hemostasis, which are generally hemophilia A, which is a deficiency in factor VIII, haemophilia B, which is a deficiency in factor IX, and then there are rare factor deficiencies, including uh, factor 12, factor 10, factor 11, factor 7, and really rarely factor 5, as well as others. Uh, there are a lot of medications or anticoagulant factors. They're the ones that affect secondary hemostasis. We talked about before warfarin that affects 2, 7, 9, and 10 through vitamin K antagonism to prevent recycling of vitamin K in the body. We've also got newer ones like apixaban and rivaroxaban that actually in, uh, inactivate factor 10A when it's formed. So then you reduce the activation of prothrombin to thrombin. Uh, interestingly, you'll see in their name the XABAN, the XA is the factor 10A. That's how you know and you can remember what the effect of that drug is. And then we can have other ones like heparin and anoxaparin, which are heparin based medications that primarily affect uh, factor 2 and factor 10A via antithrombin. So they increase the activity of antithrombin to then reduce um, factor 10A and factor 2 activation. So the clinical features of secondary hemostasis disorders is usually intermittent excessive bleeding. So the platelet plug can form because primary hemostasis is preserved. After the platelet plug forms, it's not, not able to be cemented uh, with the cross-linking of the fibrin. And so without that fibrin, after a matter of minutes or hours, that um, platelet plug will dissolve without being held because there's constant flow of blood that will gradually shear it away. So you get this pattern where someone bleeds initially and then stops bleeding and then bleeds again, then stops bleeding, then bleeds again. In more severe disorders, you just get continuous bleeding because there's absolutely no fibrin cross-linking happening occur at all. Um, the bleeding that occurs in this is not classically mucocutaneous like primary hemostatic disorders are. So here we'll see, particularly in haemophilia patients, um, heme arthrosis, which is where there's a bleeding into a joint, uh, as well as bleeding into muscles, or muscular bleeds, uh, and rarely intracerebral hemorrhage, which is obviously a life-threatening uh, and disabling event to occur. And generally you'll find that there's bleeding with minimal provocation. So even like a paper cut, which usually be really well contained, bleeds more excessively than you would expect. So to conclude this session, I like to think of hemostasis as being a spectrum. We talked at the beginning, what is hemostasis? It's how the body ensures appropriate flow of blood to maintain organ perfusion. And it does that through a balance of bleeding and thrombotic formation. So we've got um, the right balance is normal hemostasis. And as we shift towards a procoagulant state, we get spontaneous or excessive thrombosis. So where a thrombus should occur, it happens in a much larger scale than it should and causes collateral damage through occlusion of vessels, particularly arteries. That's where we get heart attacks. It's where we get strokes. It's where we get limb ischemia from. That's excessive thrombotic formation due to certain triggers. And then on the other side, if we have um, too much thinning of the blood to protect against inappropriate thrombotic formation, we get spontaneous bruising and bleeding, which also can be life-threatening and will obviously impair the ability of the, of the flow of blood to ensure adequate organ uh, perfusion. And I've listed a number of conditions there that you may or may not be familiar with, and some of which we've mentioned in this particular session, that either shift the balance of hemostasis towards the procoagulant state or an anticoagulant state, and then resulting in complications. In the next talk, we'll talk particularly about the therapeutics of antiplatelet agents, uh, anticoagulant agents, and thrombolytic therapy, how they affect the hemostatic spectrum when thrombosis has occurred.